she should have used Calderona. It's smooth sailing with the highly successful sound of wonderful Radio London. <clears throat> At um the risk of destroying my private headspace and transforming it into public solitude, I'm going to tell this story. The, the book, uh, Wish You Were Here, that I wrote with Patricia Pearson, it's coming out in about two weeks. And there's, there's a chapter in there uh, I believe it's chapter seven. I believe it's called um, Remember a Day. It opens like this. In 1975, when Teresa still lived at home in Montreal, her father was driving back from a business trip on the east-west highway that links Ontario's border, crossing at Detroit with the edges of Quebec, the 401 Near the town of Cornwall, he saw a young woman of about his daughter's age standing with her arm raised and her thumb up, calm and hopeful for a ride. That, um, that's partly true. It's not entirely true. And it's it's stuck in my craw the whole time. Uh, We were, um, like sculpting this um for the most part i prefer wherever possible even if it's mundane even if it's convoluted to tell the absolute truth don't embellish don't cut corners tell it like it is but in this case we didn't it wasn't a business trip uh my father rarely went on business trips uh west of of Quebec. Uh, He usually went on business trips to the interior north of Quebec. Uh, But it was expedient to say a business trip. What he was really doing, what he was really doing was he went to Cornwall, just across the Quebec border into Ontario, and then a little further to a campground near Long Sioux Parkway. And he set up this tent. We had this old canvas army tent. And his mission was to set this thing up um, at the campground uh, in wait for the arrival of Teresa. Teresa had decided to go on this uh about a hundred mile bike ride from Montreal to Long Sioux. Um, And when she got there, she was going to camp. And so, um, so, but it was too, too big. You know, this is the seventies. It's a very, it was about a, we all fit in that thing. Actually, We, we used to go vacationing and then all five of us, when we were little, so it was quite a big tent. You couldn't carry it on, you know, like nowadays, uh, you know, in a, in packs on your bike. Uh, you know, back then you could you'd you'd have saddle bags uh, on the front of the, your handlebar. You'd you'd keep your rucksack, your 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 sleeping bag. <laughs> this kind of you know, carry a pack on your back. That's kind of how. You, you did it. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, you, it's not like today. Today, I think you, you can get away with maybe 30 pounds or something. Back then, you'd be, you know, can you imagine a canvas? A, a canvas tent. That thing weighed a ton. That, <laughs> that uses green army tent. That thing, that thing. And then when it got wet, are you kidding me? You couldn't fucking lift the thing. Uh you know, not like now with nylon and stuff like this. No, it's canvas. Oh my god. 
So he sets this thing up for her so she can take this 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 trip uh, that she was taking solo. Solo. She wanted to do it alone. No help. <laughs> Except for my dad driving and setting up a tent. But no help. Uh, so, the, but, but it was, uh, you know, it was all, how, how do you, how do you write that sentence? And we tried to write that sentence, you know, uh, in 1975, Bob Allure, you know, drove up to Cornwall to set up a tent for his daughter who was taking a bike trip. And on his way back, he picked up a hitchhiker and it just didn't, it just didn't work. You know, it wasn't eloquent. Um, earlier in the book, we, we dealt all with, with Teresa's obsession fascination with biking and we didn't want to revisit it so we cut a corner and we just said business trip and this bugged me this i it just because it's not true <laughs> he wasn't on a friggin business trip all right he was on assignment for his eldest daughter um and, and again there's I guess the point I'm making is there's not a lot in the the book where we cut a corner. Uh, at all costs, I try to avoid it because I think the absolute truth, no matter how bizarre or twisted or mundane sometimes it may be, is absolutely the right step to to take. And... You know, it goes without saying that uh, biking biking was important to Teresa. You know, it it represented uh, freedom. It was, uh, you know, I, I think it was the the one outlet where she felt absolutely free. Um, you know, she's an attractive young woman. Uh, I imagine, you know, anybody anybody who runs today knows you get cat called and harassed but you know on a bike if you're going that fast if you if you had a racing bike and Teresa had a you know nowadays we call it a road bike then it was called a racing bike you know if you're approaching some you know some goon or something you wouldn't even be able to tell the gender from far away um you know by the time you know somebody was ready to do something you'd, you'd be long past so I think she just didn't have to deal with that element of sexual harassment uh, when she was on her bike. And so I think it really, you know, liberated her. Uh, as I say, freedom. And, and, you know, there's something childlike about riding a bike that is just um, wonderful. And I think as she did, you know, she would bop around everywhere on that thing. You know, not only inner city and, and suburban, you know, to and fro to, you know, commuting and stuff, but, but also like on weekends, long rides, long rides all over the island and off the island of, of Montreal. Um, and, you know, at one, one, at one time I know she was, she was trying to organize like a bike trip, uh, you know, for a couple of weeks in the Netherlands that never really came together you know so she had ambition she had aspirations with this uh and you know the, the bike was often in a shop you know with a mechanic i know it was in the shop when she died um because i remember after her body was found we had to we had to go to that mechanics on to carry to pick up um the bike it's um it's a batechia it's an Italian racing bike, a green Batechia. Uh, and, you know, as, as I did when I was a kid. So she had that for about a year. Um, really fancy. At, at, at the time, in the, like 75, 6, it was, a, it was a $500 bike. And that was that was dropping a lot of money. I was dropping, a, I, I don't know who paid for it. My father probably paid for it. Maybe my mother. Um, a lot of, a lot of dough. And, you know, within a year I had a, a black Peugeot bike. It wasn't as, it wasn't as good, but you know, 10 speeds, that's all you, you know, a 10 speed bike was a, was a big deal then. Um, and I, I still have that bike out in the, in the shed. Um, 
here in North Carolina. Uh, and it's, it's intact, right? There's even like a, like a leather pouch on the back of the seat where you keep, uh, you know, your tools. And I, you know, it still has the tools. Leather's in pretty good shape. Uh, it still has the rat traps. You know, the nowadays you have shoes that lock in uh, to the pedals. Then, then you had rat traps, they were called, that you'd actually, you know, it was a metal contraption that you actually put your sneaker in so you could, uh, you know, you could pull up as, uh, as well as push down when you were, when you were cycling. Um, uh, it has everything except, uh, the bike pump, uh, the, the pump fit on to, you know, one of the, you know, the, the bike at the center is a triangular shape of metal and it fit into these you know, in there onto one of these strands or of, of metal, you know, so you'd have it and you could change a flat if you got caught, you know, out on the road or something like that. Um, but it doesn't have the pump. Uh, and as, as I recollect, I think it was me who lost the pump. And if I'm, if I'm honest with myself, the, the reason I, it got lost as I used to love playing with it, you know, it's what, 12, 13 or something. And, and what I used to love, um, you know, I, I must've saw, I saw this in some kind of James Bond movie or something where a guy had a, a gun or a dart that was a bicycle pump. So it was, uh, you know, it was a disguised weapon and, you know, you'd, You'd pump it to cock it and then shoot the guy. I can't remember. It, you know, that, that plays out in um, in Steven Spielberg's Munich uh, where they shoot the, the, the honeypot woman uh, in the Netherlands, actually, I think, on, on, on a boat. Um, but it, obviously it wasn't, it, it, it's not from Munich. It's from James Bond or Matt Helm or, you know, one of those, Matt Helm, oh, geez. <laughs> Was that the Dean Martin knockoff? Uh, in like Flint, maybe it was that James Coburn. What it was one of those, uh, rat think a boo boo kind of things. <laughs> anyway, so I would use the the pump as a as a gun. You know, you know, run around the backyard. You know, running through the sprinkler, pretending to shoot spies, <laughs> and and I lost the pump. Okay, forty years later, I'm 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 fessing I'm fessing up to it. You know, it's it's uh, interesting. Uh, we've uh, we used Kraftwerk, the 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 music Kraftwerk on uh, on the Deary Corbet Corbet revisit there. In uh, in doing that, I I found out that you know Kraftwerk broke up uh, legendarily over a bicycle pump. You know, like like one of the guys didn't return one of the other guys bicycle pumps and that was it you know they, <laughs> they they never recorded again never appeared live again that's it you Dita you took my pump and it was it was gone it was over you know uh it's amazing you know these guys who were like german engineers who become the poster boys for techno pop uh and it all ends over a mis misunderstanding about a bicycle pump. <laughs> Life isn't fair. Justice is blind and dysfunctional. And some cops aren't smart and dedicated like on television. This is who killed Teresa.
I knew for about a year I was I was going to buy a road bike. And even even before that, um, the idea was floating around my head for, for many, many years. I can't explain why I hadn't done it, why it took me so long to pull the trigger. I, I knew it uh, uh, a year ago this September, in fact. I, I was visiting my brother in Montreal, and, uh, and he's, he's a rider, um, very serious. He competes uh, in races and stuff like that. Uh, uh, he's not any good. <laughs> uh, he competes about you know, uh, he he competes against himself. You know, as as I I think increasingly a lot of us do as as we get old, older with with sports and and things like that. It it becomes a uh, you know like a game within a game. Um, to uh, um, to to ease the mind. Um, to uh, calm thoughts, uh, and I and I could see the influence on him, and, and uh, I could see that it was going to be a a, a, a good influence on on me. I I'd, I've been running, but for a variety of reasons, I was losing interest in it. So, so I was I was visiting Montreal, and he 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 took me out. Uh, we borrowed uh, a friend's road bike. You know, so it was the there was the whole deal. You know, it was serious. Like you know, like a bike between you know like a couple of thousand dollar bikes. So you know, many gears and uh, if you know if you're not into this stuff, I, I won't I won't bore you with bike details. That's not what this is about. You know, a lot of gears, very fast. Uh, so the whole deal, you know, with uh, you know, really streamlined helmet and. Uh, and the shoes, right? The shoes that lock into um, the pedals. Um, and and I remember him saying to me, he said, uh, he said, now you're going to fall down. Uh, you, you, you're going to fall down. You're, 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 you're going to be locked in there and you're going to start going over at some point. He said, I don't know when, but you're going to feel totally helpless. And you know, it's going to be like the Eiffel Tower or something coming down. And and you're gonna you're gonna crash into the pavement, and it's gonna it's gonna hurt like hell. Um, and I, I remember thinking, well, no, 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 I got this. I got. This. He said, no, no, trust me, because um, it won't be having your feet locked in like that. And there's a trick to getting them out, right? There's, you kind of you kind of have to flip your foot in order to unlock it from the pedal. Uh, he said, but it takes a while to learn that. You, you know the muscle memory, and and you're gonna fall, and it's gonna hurt, and and sure enough, you know it was toward the end of the ride, you know I'd almost done, we we'd been we'd been out for a number of hours, and it was toward the end, coming back to his home, um, that I I you know I came to the end of a a, a path, a bike path, um, and uh, and just as he you know, like he called it, you know he was at a stop sign where there's traffic and there were of course a lot of people around so a lot of people observing and I just slowly you know I wasn't I, I stopped thinking and so I thought I was on a traditional bike and I didn't know what to do with my feet so I panicked and then I just slowly went over and bam you know right on my 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 right knee which I had damaged uh, the year before, so it it hurt like hell, and it was embarrassing. You know, people saying, "Are you all? Are you all right? Are you are you all right?" Like, of course, I'm not all right. I, I just fell on my ass. <laughs> so that was that was that, and um, you know, I, I remember. You know, it was it was a it was a Saturday. It was a Saturday, um, and he goes, "We're gonna go for we're gonna go for a ride." And I said, "Oh, where we're we gonna go?" He said, "Well, we're gonna head north about thirty kilometers." I said, "Where?" He said, "We're gonna go to Saint Jerome," and I was like, "Oh my fuck!" Um, and this was uh, funny, but not ha ha funny, because I had just spent the prior week 
every single day, uh, you know, from about eight to four in Saint Jerome, uh, for for reasons, uh, if you read the book, that will become astronomically funny. Here he was uh, in my on my day of recreation, uh, returning me to Saint Jerome. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the, but the ride was you know it was it was great you know it, like a lot of urban landscapes they've uh, they've uh, transitioned you know their rail corridors to bike paths so you're you're bopping along uh, you know it, it first it's suburban but then it gets very very countryfied. Uh, a lot of farmers' fields and stuff like this, and you know churches in the distance, and uh, you know it's idyllic. Uh, it's it's northern Quebec. There's nothing better. And um, you know at the end of the journey, you know in Saint Jerome, you know the the path naturally ends at uh, at a terminus at the at the old train station, and you know it's really nice. You know it's a train station that has now been refurbished, you know, this kind of rec center across the patio concourse. There's a nice bar, people, you know, sitting outside in uh, plastic chairs, enjoying, a, you know, a Pilsner micro beer or something. Uh, very, very, very nice. And, uh, uh, and I, and I knew at the time I was, I was going to get a bike. Um, and I knew I was going to get one just like his, because that's the kind of that's the kind of brothers we are, and, and as I say, it it took a while. Uh, you know, all through the winter, I I kind of sat on my ass and and thought about it, which is what I do. Um, and then you know, in in early March when we were under lockdown, it became less inviting to go running when you, when you'd go running you know i live in a i live on the i live on the border of farmland just but it's uh, carborough chapel hill is still very you know pretty much the, the whole area of mid mid-sized cities raleigh durham but uh, you know very i think you'd call it suburban and uh, so there there were if you ran, there were a lot of people out walking, walking pets, uh, running, cycling, a, lo- a lot of exposure. Um, and I, I wasn't, I wasn't digging it much. Um, so I, I thought, and I thought, I kept thinking, um, and then slowly, you know, March goes by, April goes by and I, I'd put on some weight, um, you know, and this was not a sustaining a proposition, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was it was an exponentially growing proposition um that c- it could not sustain itself uh so um uh one day i just got the the, the idea uh to go into my local bike shop and and um spend some cash uh and it was may 20th may 20th and uh which uh, I didn't plan it that way, but that just happened to be the date uh, that Teresa set out on this bike ride to Long Sioux, Cornwall, stayed in that army, green army tent. Uh, so symbolic. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how it turned out that way, but it, but it did. So I, I went into this, this bike shop. Uh, you know, I'm a little weary of these things. I don't really want to belong to that club of folks who, you know, have the matching jersey and padded shorts and, and all the shit. Um, um, but nevertheless, I was joining that club. I knew, I knew that. And, uh, I went in and picked out a really expensive, uh, road bike. Um, and then of course there's the, the, the accoutrements and, uh, at first, I thought the sales person was trying to, you know, sell me up on stuff. And, well, you need, she was like, you need, 
you need lights on the front and back. And I said, well, I'm not dry. I'm not riding at night. She said, she said you, you moron. It's not for riding at night. It's so you don't get hit. by So they can see you, you know, in, in the fog, uh, you know, at dawn, wh- whatever. Uh, don't, don't be an idiot. Take, spend 20 bucks on the lights. Uh, two bottles, you know, one, she said, one for your water and one for your power drink, you know, for salts and stuff like that. Sugar, salt. I don't know. I don't know what's in that crap. Uh, a whole pump kit, you know, now the pump, the pump is just a, you know, it's, it's a, it's about the size of my, my middle finger tube of, uh, of, of air, you know, very, very quickly compresses tire, uh, rubber tire, all this shit. Um, I know, helmet, gloves, padded shorts. Actually, I didn't get the padded shorts at first. Uh, and, and I learned my lesson because it, for a couple of, uh, for for about a week, I went out without the shorts, and I was like, "This is this also is not a sustaining proposition." So I went back. I got some bike shorts. I committed to that. Uh, the shoes, uh, uh, the dangerous shoes, <laughs> uh, and and you know that was it. Uh, I was I was hooked, and then I remember saying to her, "Well, where do you go?" and uh, she showed me they had a map on the wall of all these, um, you know, bike routes around the Durham Chapel Hill area. And I said, well, how do you get that? And she said, well, you know, there's an app for it. There are many apps, but the one I use is Strava. Uh, Strava, you can you can get a bike app. and uh, But if you're going to need that, you're going to need your cell phone. And if you need your cell phone... You need a mechanism on the front of your handlebars to attach your cell phone to. So, right, so the the money's adding up. I had I had overspent my budget. I'd gone in uh, with a plan, as I always do, um, and I quickly blew the budget. Uh, but just that week, actually, the the economics uh, economic stimulus money had come in, and I'd gotten mine. Uh, it gave you a debit card. With the American flag on it, like, fuck off. <laughs> uh, so I, I got this. So I, I had a little, I had a little, a cushion. So I, you know, I, I dropped thousands, thousands of dollars <laughs> on a on a bike that I, I, you know, I, I knew I was going to do it once. I was not confident, you know, that this was going to, you know, how long this would sustain itself, how long this would sustain itself. Uh, but um, no, I I I took to it uh, uh, like a fish in water. Um, absolutely, uh, absolutely loved it. Um, it was it was love at first sight from 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 the moment uh, I I I put that foot in the pedal. <laughs> It's very addictive, um, the, the whole phenomena, not only the riding, but, um, you know, monitoring your, your ride through this piece of software, Strava, which counts your kilometers, and, and then you can come home and you can an- analyze your ride and all this kind of stuff. And, and at first, I, I thought it was all bullshit. I was like, I'm not going to do this. Um, I, but I needed it in order. I needed the maps. Because otherwise, I, I'd be, you know, running into, um, you know, gravel roads and shit or, you know, dead ends. And I was like, well, that's that's just going to be an exercise in frustration. So I need I needed the mapping software. So I started to do that. But but then slowly, you, you know, you start to watch it and, uh, you know, without realizing it, you're bench you're benchmarking yourself. So, you know, end of May, June. You know, it was it was on again and off. I'd go out every couple of days, uh, you know, and you know by by the end of it, I was sort of semi conscious of of 
my mileage. Um, but then there was there was some kind of challenge, you know, can you ride a hundred miles this month? And, you know, in my mind, I was like, oh, wow, a hundred miles. That's, that's a lot. Right. And, uh, but, um, you know, by, by the end of the month, I'd, I'd, I'd ridden 650 miles, you know, and that was just sort of like the, uh, you know, setting the mark without, without really trying, um, very hard. So, so then I, I was, and then I saw, you know, the other thing about this Strava thing is, you know, like any social media, you can, you can friend the people that you know who also use this. And, and I, I was really not into that very much. Uh, you know, it, you know, I saw people I know and it's like, no, no, man, this is, uh, this is my thing. I don't want to be sharing that shit, but, um, uh, my, my old boss who I always knew was a writer, um, like friended me on, on Strava. And I was like, well, that's okay. Cause you know, Ken has been a cyclist for, uh, you know, as long as I've known him and he's retired now and I might learn some things. So you kind of go over and, you know, look, look how he's riding. And clearly, you know, Ken's about 10 years older than me. And, uh, you know, he's easily clocking, uh, a thousand miles a month, easily, easily, you know, in just in casual, right? You know, he's easily doing, uh, 120 clicks, uh, you know, in a single ride. And I'm like, holy shit. So then of course I want to do a, a hundred kilometer ride. And, and, uh, and my first attempt, I, I crapped out, but by the second one I did it. And so, as I say, you know, it's very, very addictive. And, um, so I, I got it in my mind to do a thousand miles and, um, and, and, you know, so the next thing I know, I, I'm into this routine in, uh, I guess in, in August, uh, I kind of worked it out where I, I'm a morning guy. So routinely I, I do my, my ride, you know, seven in the morning, I'm right out the door. Uh, and, and I developed like a, a 53 K double loop. I'd go around twice this, this farmland and, uh, 53 K was about, it's about 32, 33 miles a day times 31 days. I figured, you know, if I, if I kept up that pace, I'd have my thousand miles by the, by the end of August. Um, and so I settled into this, this, routine uh right all all the while you know monitoring ken my old boss wasn't doing the same thing but he obviously was much more experienced at it so i'm i'm kind of watching over my you know digitally over my shoulder what he's up to and and trying to learn best practices from them and uh so this this is my this is my 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 routine on a currently uh on a daily basis. I head out my house, um, you know, and then uh, into what what I call dairy land because it's a lot of cows and shit. Um, and uh, like the, the last stoplight is at this corner where there's this there's this old garage and a mechanic it's at a, an area called Calvander's and the guy who runs this mechanic shop it's really old it looks like it's been there since the 20s you know he's a marine vet so there's the there's the marine flag and the MIA flag on the side of the building um and then you know you you take a left there and and you you head out into farmland right uh, the first thing you pass, uh, major mark, is like um, Maple Maple View Farms, which is a local dairy. They got a, uh, you know, they got a shop there, which obviously isn't open now because of uh, the stage of uh, the pandemic we're in. But usually, I mean, that's where I used to take my kids, you know, you know for an ice cream, local dairy. You'd sit on the sit on the porch, look at the corn and shit. So pass there, you know, a lot of farms, a lot of silos, barns old abandoned uh outbuildings from from when it was all uh 
tobacco land, you know, rotting, these kind of things. Cows, there's a donkey, uh, there's a goat farm with uh, three lambs on it. Uh, at one point, there's a, there's a volunteer fire department. There's, there's, like, there's, there's this one blue heron. I think it's a blue heron. I know it's a heron. Stick bird uh, at this like retaining pond. He's. Uh, I'm waiting for him to leave, right, to Florida, any day now, because we're we're getting uh, we're getting past the summer. Uh, but he's usually there uh, around Kirk Farm. I, I, uh, it's got, it's got this old abandoned gas pump, which is really cool. Uh, and there are these. There's these cows that it took me about 50 loops, right? As I say, a double loop. It took me about 40 or 50 times to realize that cows come out of the barns in the morning and they, they kind of go down this uh, sluice gate. And then I'm like, well, where the hell do they go? Where are they heading? Well, there's an actual tunnel under the road. It's rural road, right? So, it you know. A farmer dug it at one time, so they that they can get into the paddock and the field. So I say, like, from the fortieth time, I'm like, oh, that's where the where the cows are going, you idiot. Uh, you know, um, Kirk Farms is right uh, is adjacent to Cane Creek Farms. These guys, Cane Creek is really kind of well known in this area. Uh, they've got. They've got a lot of livestock, and, and they're known for their quality beef and goat and and, and lamb and, and shit, pork. they got a lot of pigs, uh, those, those kind of foodie pigs. Uh, and they usually fuck off in the winter, you know, when they go on, like, the culinary lecture tour in southern France and all that. They're that big. There's, there's, there's a lot of farmers in the area who are, like, f- food rock stars. Uh, I don't know so much in this day and age they are, but um, so Cane Creek, Cane, Cane Creek is right. Uh, uh, you know, it 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 buttresses up against the Cane Creek uh, Reservoir, uh, which is very, very, very pretty. <laughs> So what else? There's, um, you know, there's this like DIY roadside mailbox and it, it's kind of big and looming and it's, it's gray and brown. And, and every time I round this corner, I, I sort of, you know, I startle myself, right? Because for half a second, I think it's a moose, <laughs> which is, which is absurd, right? <laughs> But it's, yeah, kind of go, you know, I go around the corner. Like every time it fools me, right? Like, oh, Jesus, for fuck's sakes, it's the fucking wooden moose again, right? And, and it, you know, it kind of looks, if you, you remember that Bugs Bunny cartoon where Bugs builds like a wooden moose to, to trick the Tasmanian devil, right? I was a mean little devil. Right? <laughs> You're a mean little devil. Ha ha ha. That's very funny. Oh, oh, five o'clock. Time to close the shop. So there's the moose, there's the moose, right? Which, which is a again. There are certain things along the road doing this pattern that uh, are semi uh, disturbing, unsettling. I guess uns, un, unsettling. Uh, for instance, you know, there's this, there's a, there's a, there's a long haul trucker, obviously, who lives in this, uh, double wide trailer along the way. It's got, it's got these two hummingbird feeders on either side of the stairs leading up to this wood porch, uh, on the trailer. And, uh, you know, it's, it's always looks abandoned, but you know somebody lives there because uh, on Sunday mornings you see the guy's the guy's rig, and then for the other six days he's gone for the week, you know, to God knows where, um, in his truck. There's uh, 
this vintage Airstream trailer, you know, one of those silver without corners, rounded trailers tucked back in the woods at this one place. Um, and other than being like covered with about two decades, uh, decades of pine straw, it looks like it's in, in pretty good shape, but it's, it's kind of weird. It took me a while, you know, on this circuit. It took me a couple of times, a couple of weeks before I noticed it. It's like, that's, that's weird. Um, hmm. You know, there's, there's, uh, there's sections of it that, uh, you know, remind me of things. Uh, I don't know, like, like, um, it, you, you can kind of feel like you're transforming, right? Like a mind slip time trip thing. So at certain points, I'm no longer in North Carolina. I'm, you know, I'm in, in a Quebec landscape, you know, very, very, uh, very similar to like, a ride uh, up Lake Memphis Magog, Vail Perkins, Austin Magog. Uh, there's there's points that remind me of my childhood, so uh, this will mean nothing to you. But the Ponderosa, uh, Pine Acres, Valleyfield, Quebec, uh, Rosemeath, Ontario, Sterling, Frankfurt, um, that area. I often you know see like elements of my my grandfather's farmhouse. Uh, my cousin Charlie, for some reason, comes to mind a lot. Uh, uh, Mariev uh, La Rivière's French farmhouse near Saint Polycarp. I see that a lot sometimes. The uh, the garage where uh, Carol Dupont was found murdered in Saint Therese. There's a there's a point at a where at a corner where I where I see that. Yeah, smells, you know, pine, uh, cow manure, diesel and tar, cut grass. Uh, this, the, the, the sounds really, crickets, cicadas, chickadee, mockingbird, titmouse, rooster, crowing. After a while, when, when you start getting good at it, uh, there's nothing more satisfying than just destroying someone on a hill. <laughs> you, you, you know, they're, they're, they're chugging up the hill. And, and I say this because early on it happened to me a lot. I'd be just, just working overtime going up a hill and somebody or a team would just fly by me. You know, it's just, it's demoralizing completely. And, but, but you adapt, right? You say, well, I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that to somebody and it's going to make me feel really good. And that's, that's sure enough. That's, you know, that's what happened. Um, you know, it happens a lot and it becomes, it becomes really motivating when you can do it. And, and then when you start realizing you can do it and repeat it um, and and that, that certain riders can't touch you. Uh, there was a guy the other day who had the audacity to wear a, a polka dot jersey. Um, so I left Mr. King of the Mountain uh, eating my dust on this steep incline, right? And, and so I go by him uh, up the hill and, and I can hear him behind me and he's gassed. And, and he actually yells at me. He's like, what, what kind of bike is that? Uh, uh, it's, it's a Trek domain. Okay. But really, you know, that, that, that wouldn't matter to you, uh, your majesty. <laughs> See ya. And you're, you know, you're gone. Um, it, it's true. I mean, uh, I, I can be very competitive. My brother is very competitive. Teresa was very competitive. Um, not always, but when I want to be. I can be that way and uh, can can uh, uh, 
you know, be be uh, attentive to some of my my lesser qualities. But nevertheless, there it is. You know, you feel good for a moment. <laughs> And I do. I'm sorry. I do. Um, you know, and, and as you're on these circuits, you know, eventually you start seeing some of the same players, right? It's like, oh, yeah, there's that jerk again. Uh, there's there's a pretty girl again. Uh, couple on a tandem bike. Uh, the color-coordinated uh, Malo Jean boys, you know, there they are. Strange things. Uh there's a dog that sometimes chases me, and and the first time he did it, it scared the absolute shit out of me. I was I was like seven years old again. He just came out of nowhere, um, and I was going up a hill actually, so I couldn't outrun him. Uh, and he was he was trying to bite my leg, and just yip 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 the entire time. And and uh, so I'm trying to talk him down. He's like, whoa, hey, easy guy, easy. <laughs> I'm trying to go up this hill. But it was, it was absolutely, I mean, I regressed to like, I, I got bit by a dog as a kid. Um, I remember this. Uh, around the time that my dad picked up that hitchhiker, in fact. Um, in fact, I think I was bandaged when we, when we picked uh, her up. Uh, anyway, that, that was terrifying. Um, uh, there was this large snapping turtle. I came around a corner one time. And, and a, a car had actually stopped and, and I thought there was an accident. But as I got closer, like in, in the right of way, there was this snapping turtle and, uh, it, you know, ex- exaggeration wants me to say it was the size of like a truck wheel. It, it wasn't the size of a truck wheel, it was, it, but it was, it, it was the size of a car wheel. I mean, the thing was ancient. And I remember just going, whoa, 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 whoa. I mean, but you keep on going, boom, you know, go flying by. Um, I saw a woman uh, in a car uh, run another car off the, off the road with this guy, which was weird. You know, you want to know what the story was behind that. Uh, left him at these crossroads, uh, the side of the road, and then he sped off chasing her. Uh, that was bizarre. Uh, there's, um, and this this is really bizarre. This is, there's there's this one cornfield with a a drainage ditch like a backwash um that looks like it could be the movie stand in for the place that Teresa's body was found between Compton and Compton station you know and uh in 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 the eastern townships and it's very bizarre. I, I, I mean, I don't get scared going through there, but it's just like an eerie reminder, you know, in the early morning and you're silently pedaling by there twice, right? Because I said it's a double loop. Um, and there's no one around at that hour, usually. Uh, and it, it's it's eerie. You, you you begin to catalog dead animals up the evolutionary chain, you know, along the road. Snake, frog, mouse, bird, possum, coon, cat, dog, stag. There's the refuse of the road. Surgical masks, Bud Light and White Claw cans. Uh, at at one point, there's there's this baby blanket that will not go away. Will not go away, and I don't like seeing it. It's it's one of those hospital deals straight from the maternity ward, white with those uh, white cotton with those blue and red stripes. It it usually looks like it's wet and reeking of mildew or something. didn't take long for my mind to start churning down uh, familiar paths uh, almost immediately almost immediately I had the thought have have there been cyclists who have disappeared or who were murdered 
um, and and of course, uh, there's the the two girls the documented in the in in the book A Strange Piece of Paradise, which we've talked about before, riding out of Portland in the 1970s on a cross America bike trip and. Almost immediately out of uh, Portland, they're attacked in an Oregon campground. Their their tents run over by a pickup truck, and and one of the girls is attacked with an axe. So uh, there's that case. Uh, the American cyclist uh, Frank Lenz disappeared in Turkey in 1894, attempting to to cycle the globe. Was never heard from again. Recently, uh, Suzanne uh, Morphew disappeared in May in Colorado while going out for a solo trip, though I think, uh, I think the husband is the lead suspect in that one. So then y- your mind begins to re-inventory all the cases you know where victims have disappeared on bikes. Uh, Marie Chantal Desjardins, disappeared on a bike. Uh, Claudette Poirier disappeared on a bike. Cedrica Provencher, they were all on on bike rides when they disappeared. Uh, Melanie Dequin's killer, Michel Deary, trolled the Drummondville area uh, on a bike. Um, and, you know, this this cataloging, this, it becomes like a game of uh, old maid. You're in you're in the zone on the ride, but at the same time, your mind is unintentionally mapping these these associations. You know, flipping the cards, and you know, but always be aware of that that one that one dreaded wolf card. So then your mind begins to to question things on the ride. You know, what about what about that? Long haul trucker with the two hummingbird feeders. You know, wasn't, wasn't there a shipping container behind his, his double wide? You know, who's who's chained up in there? I wonder. What what what's the real story behind that woman who ran that car off the road? I mean, there's got to be an opening to a pretty good short story there. Um. Sometimes riding, uh, I unintentionally scare myself. One one time I reached up to it, like adjust my helmet. Um, and the sound of my thumb rubbing against uh, the moisture on the lid of it it, 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 it suddenly roared like a transport horn. I mean, it didn't, but that's what it sounded like to me. Uh, and, and I thought I was being run off the road. Uh, Right, but when I when I glanced back behind me, there was nothing there. So you spook yourself. Uh, you know, one of the worst is when you when you think you're riding in in solitude, only to have someone creep up behind you from nowhere and and ride past. Uh, that uh, that you know that is that is the worst. You know, it it it's some so you know sometimes if they're if they're nice, they'll say on your left and give you a warning or good morning. But sometimes they don't, and it just absolutely scares the shit out of you. Uh, another time I was so focused on my pace that I didn't notice that I'd come to this patch of like cracked pavement, like this Frankenstein checkerboard. Um, and and the, the sound uh, of the wheel on the pavement is... It, you know, it sounded like ice cracking, and and I momentarily thought I was falling through like a, a frozen surface, descending. Uh, you know, like the ice is gonna break. This kind of thing. Um, strange. Your mind does does these things, right? Flat snake, squashed frog, dead mouse, dead bird, gutted possum, coon, cat, stag, dog. Pine, cow shit, diesel, tar, cut grass. And they, sometimes like you'll, you'll get this waft and you're like, whoa, what the hell died there? You know, right? there's, there's obviously, you know, in the bush or 
roadside, some bloated carcass, some dead animal. One time I came down this that steep incline, approaching the cornfield next to the drain ditch backwash. Uh, uh, and this, this was early morning. And it was hot. It was hot and humid. But as I approached that spot, the temperature dropped about 20 degrees and it got like bone chill cold, like freakily cold. Um, and again, because it was a double loop uh, and nothing atmospherically changed. But when I, when I came to that spot again, it, um, you know, about 40 minutes later, it was gone. It was, it was, it was hot and humid. Strava. Now, Strava, this is a word, uh, and we have a Swedish listener, uh, Malin, who, who knows this, uh, a word um, that means uh, strive in, uh, in Swedish. And um, the software Strava has this feature called View Flybys. And... Um, you know, it's this beta thing that it, it took me a while to really notice it. It's, do you want to view flybys? And I was like, well, what the heck is this? So I, I went to that page and it was a little bizarre. Uh, what you can do is you can see a map of your run and you can also see uh, the route of everyone else you passed on that run who also has the Strava software. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at one right now from uh, yesterday. I passed Vince, Wes, Michael, Hannah, Dana, Wes, Heather, uh, Patty, Brandon, and Mark. Um, and what you can do is you can run an animation on it and you can you can watch in real time, well, not in real time, but in in you, you can you can watch all the people you passed and when you passed them, and when they were on your route, and when they deviated off onto another route, and and when you happen to hook up with them again, all the way from the beginning of your run. Uh, to to its conclusion and uh you know it's weird it took me a while uh to figure out what was going on here i th- th- like there's one other guy i i befriended on this because he was a friend of ken my old boss uh and he was also an expat he's a he's a canadian in in, in the united states so so i i I started following this guy on Strava and, uh, you know, he made some comment about, uh, man, you, you had a good run today, you know, something like that. And, uh, uh, if, if you keep going that route, you're going to pass me as the all time champion or something. Um, and then, and then one day I was, I was riding and, uh, got to a point where I saw a cyclist coming towards me. Uh, and as, and as he passed, he yelled out, he said, uh, Hey John, uh, you're you're on a good pace this morning, and just fly by, and 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 I was like, what, what the hell is that all about? You know how how does this guy know my name? Uh, and then I realized it's it's the guy uh, who I friended on the software, and he obviously knows my route, he knows my pattern, um, and he's commenting on my habits. Right, which uh, was not at all comforting, in the least, um, because if he can know my route, then obviously I can know Hannah's and Dana's and Patty's and Heather's, uh, and not only can I know their routes, I can know where they started them, and. Uh, if they started at a trailhead, okay, that's one thing. Uh, I know their license plate. But 
if they started from their home, now I know where Hannah and Patty and Dana live. And uh, this became really, really unsettling. So, so now you have the perfect tool to become a sexual predator. And that's where my mind goes. And it wasn't, uh, to be perfectly honest, it wasn't just my mind uh, that was that was going there. Uh, Cosmopolitan recently had an article uh, in early August that said Strava users are calling out the app's creepy privacy settings. And, and it's true, it's a setting and you can opt out of it, but... Um, only if you know it's there. The, the default is to opt in. They, they might have changed it now. But uh, <laughs> again, that's where my mind goes, is that, okay, so this is, this is much easier than... In the, look at the effort you had to do in the day to stalk someone. I mean, you had to put in serious time, you, you know, in your beater driving the roads, uh, uh, looking for patterns, looking for people. But now you can, you can do it from, you can do it from the comfort of your home. Uh, and I'll give you one better is that the, the, the software will, will work regardless if you're on a bike or not. So you can put, you can put Strava on your cell phone in your car and much more efficiently you can, you can you can drive a pattern and then study the pattern and see who you know if you saw somebody of interest pass you uh you could then study them and figure out what they're doing what their habits are uh you know it's very unsettling uh i i'm a creature of habit so it wouldn't take anyone long to realize that i i am conditioned to run at seven o'clock in the morning um, in a very secluded farming area where there's no one around. Uh, you know, it would take nothing for somebody uh, to catch me unawares, you know, clock me with a two by four as I'm going by, drag me, uh, you know, into their back lot and into that uh, shipping container. Could do it in a heartbeat. Could do it in a heartbeat. It's fall now, and uh, and I do I do like watching the seasons go by. Uh, it's one of my, I, 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 probably my favorite thing about the whole thing is is watching the change. You know, different weather patterns, um, different uh, angles of the sun, different sounds, different smells. Uh, and, you know. Watching the soy and the corn, you know, grow and and then, you know, the stuff that's for for human con, con, consumption to harvest sooner, stuff that's cow feed and stuff like that, they they leave to to, you know, to dry out and then uh, cut that and and mulch it, and and by now, you know, all the corn is cut now, and uh, sweet grass, it's it's all been baled. You can see the bales along the road. This morning, there's there's now a there's a John Deere combine in the field by that backwash, uh, so it's all being taken down. And uh, you know, as you ride by now, uh, the the corn, uh, you, you, you know, the twelve foot corn or whatever it is has been replaced right by corn husks stubs sticking out of this, this hard clay, uh, you know, like rebarb through concrete. I, um, I got lost yesterday. I thought, I thought I was, I knew where I was going, but, um, I took a slightly different route. And, and when I, when I came to these crossroads, I, 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 th- that I thought I recognized, I, I realized I, I was coming at it from a completely different direction. Um, and, and I got confused, um, you know, like, was this, 
Was this the right place? I was very, I was very disoriented. Um, it was the wrong time of day. I was actually riding at midday. Um, uh, there was too much traffic, therefore. Uh, the shadows were all wrong for, for when I'm accustomed to riding. Um, um, and, uh, you know, the only way I was able to direct myself was by studying the, the actual road. And, and, and I was thinking, if there's a divot up here followed by two missing pieces of asphalt, then I know I'm on the right road and in the right direction. Right. But again, momentarily very, very confused. Right. And then, you know, bam, two by four to the side of the head, dragged him into the woods. That's how you're going to go out. This has been Who Killed Teresa. I'm your host, John Allure. I don't want to, but I need to do some housekeeping here. Um, I'll probably cut this eventually from from uh, the program. Uh, but for now, let's leave it because a lot of you, uh, and I appreciate people following, um, listening, and, uh, and briefly, if you do follow, the best way to follow is uh, is on Twitter at uh, Teresa Lore at T H E R E S A A L L O R E or my personal Twitter handle, which is at Justice Guy, at J-U-S-T-U-S-G-U-Y. And there's also there's also a um, Facebook group called Who Killed Teresa, the podcast. You can find us there, and that's where you can get more messages. But I do, I do need to quickly communicate, because we're two away, uh, about two weeks away from publication of the book, and tell you, you know, some things about that. First, I meant what I said that if you pre-order the book and you can pre-order it now, uh, all kinds of places, particularly in Canada. But if you're willing to drop for the international sh- shipping, you can do that too. It's twice the co- uh, cost of the book, but uh, trust me, it's worth it. And I've been I, I've kept my mouth shut for three years about this thing, and I'm trying not to telegraph anything because honestly, I really want people to be be blindsided by it. I don't, I don't want to tip my hand to anything. Um, I want it to, I want readers to come at it cold and then react and respond to it. And then, and then I can certainly have a response to that reaction. Um, but, um, I'm not going to do it by giving hints and stuff like that. Just read the book. It's, it's, I don't, I, I think it's great. Um, but that remains to be that remains to be seen. Uh, but I, I meant if you do, if you pre-order it, hell, even if you don't pre-order it, if you message me an address, and it doesn't have to be your personal address, any address, I will send you a gift 
No questions, no strings attached, no fees, no nothing. I'm totally sincere about that. Message me an address and you'll get something in the mail. It's that simple. Um, I also, because, you know, at one, once upon a time, this was going to be a blitz, uh, the release. It was, uh, and it's in the contract uh, this way. Um, publication in the United States and Canada and in Canada and English and French. But then a pandemic happened. And uh, so so now it's not a blitz. It's a more iterative process. Beginning in English Canada is how it's first going to be rolled out. And I'm perfectly fine with that under the circumstances uh, because uh, then there will still be promise of like a maybe down the road, a, a book tour in the United States and in the UK. But that that is not a possibility currently. Um, and to just give you, you know, the, the, the publishing industry is, is, is in a rough spot right now. Um, and in particularly, uh, in particular, uh, the, the, the English Canadian publication was a foregone conclusion and was always going to be first. Um, but the supply chain uh, in the United States, and particularly in French Quebec with publishers, is is broken right now due to COVID. Uh, so it's, it's harder to, I mean, the way I understand it, even to get the paper, um, it, it is harder to do that. So they're prioritizing for, for uh, you know, a sure thing. So now, obviously, author like Kathy Reichs or, or uh, Louise Penny, you know, their, their stuff is going to roll out, you know, in, a, in blitz fashion. Me, um, in, you know, I'm a first-time writer, so it's a little more of a risk for these people. So they want to wait. So we'll wait, and that's fine. Uh, it's just going to take. It's just going to take a little longer, and uh, you know, quite frankly, uh, right now, like the worst thing that could happen right now uh, would be, you, you know, for a review to come out in the New York Times that would kill an American deal, because that would send people to buy it from the Canadian publisher. <laughs> you know, so who's, who's going to publish it in the United States if, if they've already lost? You know half of their market share. It's not going to happen. So, so, but believe me, I mean, if you're Canadian, you're going to be really sick of me by the end of the month. Um, because, um, from, from like the September 22nd on, uh, the book is going to be all over, uh, television and radio and print media. Um, and although there's not a, uh, physical book tour there is a virtual book tour which is kind of cool right i mean it's a zoom meeting and that's a drag i know but we're getting better at these things so uh, initially there's four and everyone can come it doesn't matter where you're from there's uh it's a modest rollout for those first because it it, it remains to be seen if they actually lead to sales and my and, but the reason we did them is is Patricia and I came back and said, you know, it's less, it's not less, it's not only about sales, it's also about presence and branding. And by the way, what about the independent booksellers who are struggling? So if they can sell 20 to 50 units, I, I want to do it. You know, that's what I want to do. So initially, um, and I'll send you, the, I'll, I'll be a mouthpiece about the dates, but uh, on the, on just like really briefly on, on September 19th, there's, there's an event at Brougham County Books in the Eastern Townships. On September 21st, there's an event with Paragraph Books in Montreal and Massey College in Toronto. And so those two things are Eastern Town, uh, East, uh, what is it? Eastern Standard Time. Eastern Standard Time. So, um, so there are like around five or seven o'clock, um, which would be very, very late for somebody in the UK. But then 
they're followed by two book events in Calgary. Um, one with Shelf Life Books in Calgary, the other with Owl's Nest Books in Calgary. And, and those are Mountain Standard Time. So they would be early morning for the UK. So there's a possibility of, you know, attending that, them. And, um, you know, we're still working things out currently, but there's there's a lot being discussed in the works about the how the, the look of those. Um, some may, may be a, a reading uh, certainly a Q and A, uh, and we may have guest panelists along with us, Patricia and I. There's some, there's some focal people from the book who we'd like to invite along, and include on uh, in the conversation. So more to come on on that, but I, I thought I at least anybody who's taken the journey so far, I thought I at least owed owed you an, an oral update on uh, on things things to come uh, really shortly. Uh, it's exciting, right? Um, but at the same time, <laughs> this, this is the way I do myself in, right? I can take something really, really exciting like this and destroy it all to shit uh, by the way my mind works with a bike ride. <laughs> it's, and I did the same thing like two years ago when, uh, if anybody listened... Uh, to that podcast uh, about when I won the when the Senate medal, and that immediately dissolved into just an absolutely frightening night about where my daughter was that that, that evening. So that's that's how I operate. Uh, I mean, not really. I'm obviously distorting facts here. Um, for the point of telling a story, uh, uh, but but that is where my mind sometimes goes. Uh, not all the time. Uh, fortunately, most of the time. Actually, I needed to. I needed to push this one out because I was sick and tired of thinking about it. Uh, I want to get back to the ride and just enjoying that. I was like, "You need to. If you don't do this by Labor Day, man, you're sunk. You're gonna be just completely obsess about it." So that's that. Anyway, have I left anything out? Anything off the table? I don't think so. This has been Who Killed Teresa? I'm your host, John Allure. Have yourselves a great, great day. The next time I dedicate my life's work to the friends I make I get what they want to hear They think I'm up to something weird And I breathe So now when they're in I get by the sheet To let them in Good night. Good night.